Just outside Traverse City, Michigan, there's a museum called the Music House. It's a renovated barn full of all sorts of musical equipment, specifically items that play themselves or are activated, like jukeboxes and player pianos. I had the opportunity to visit, and it helped me bring into focus my thoughts about displaying items, analog, digital, or musical. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Eric Vitello, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There was certainly an era in my life when you could not drag me to a museum, display, art gallery, or anything artistic unless you bribed me, or, more likely in the case of my family, surprised me. And now, later in my life, when you can't convince me I shouldn't visit the local museums, I try to understand what exactly turned me off back then. I think, for me, there was a sense that these places were static, the final resting point for interesting items with all of their beautiful aspects stripped away from them, held behind glass, untouchable, uninteractive, more of a cemetery than a place of celebration and learning. I was wrong on every level. A good museum, a great museum, is a wonder to behold. Put together by a staff who cares listening to what people want to have while still providing them the necessary ingredients to cook their own conclusions from what they see. In this way, finding myself going through Traverse City, Michigan, I had the Music House on my list. The website is simplicity itself, with very few photographs and very few indications of what's inside, other than automatons, and automatic music players, a sort of machinery that I love. For a shining moment in history, automatically playing music machines became first novelties, then technological toys, and then hit a peak of craftsmanship and wonder and being breathtaking before they even turned on, before fading away to jukeboxes, MP3 players, and now... I suppose, streaming services. The hours said 10 a.m., but it was 20 minutes of waiting outside, eager, like a kid wanting to get into a mall or a store before the door opened and a number of people milling about took my money and took us through a tour of the facility. In the main area, our guide, Tom, took us from initial examples of automatons where the use of exquisite equipment allowed the emulation of birds and musicians, and then a number of modifications to pianos, making them incredibly expensive, but also capable of playing all of the hits of the day on piano rolls. I got a chance to run a player piano where you move your legs back and forth on pedals to drive the paper rolls and control the tempo. We walked from an area that felt like a general store, showing how different music items might be for sale, over to a recreation of a saloon where honky-tonks and jukeboxes, maintained by the staff in perfect working order, were played for us one after another by the guide, telling us why this machine existed, what it was good for, why people wanted it in their saloons, and then playing a beautiful piece of music. After that, they sat us down and had us watch a silent film while a restored organ played an accompaniment that fit perfectly. The film was over a hundred years old, and it still hit all the right notes. Going upstairs, we saw the jewel of the museum, 
a room-sized music hall organ, which was the size of a tractor trailer and which could play with the sound and the force of a full orchestra, a variety of hits ranging from polkas all the way up to popular music recreated using the variety of mechanical choices that the machine had. All of it, we found out, split into 13 pieces that clicked together, enabling it to be transferred and transported. And the machine itself, maintained by grandchildren of the original experts in repairing this equipment. The fact that a family still moves around the world maintaining music hall organs is inspiring in itself. And that is a description of my tour, devoid of the sound of the music playing and lacking all of the flavor and character that our guide gave us. And Tom himself was the magic ingredient that took this from a room full of machines into a living story of what had come before and a meaning behind the exhibits that we were walking through. I think it's understanding what Tom was in all of this that's the real lesson here. The work of what I do and what others do is to acquire, to make piles, to make collections, to make file directories of materials that others may or may not understand the context of and which, left alone, they may not want to dig into to find out exactly what it contains. After all, it is so easy to be overwhelmed when there's so much material out there, and if you're not told why this is interesting, you may never, ever be inspired. I've been thinking about this a lot, especially as things have settled down when it comes to ingestion. Right now, thousands of items are pouring into the Internet Archive, but my scripts are handling things pretty well. Not everything, of course, is being handled automatically and placed into the appropriate collection, but it becomes a chore that I can work on and know that when I've gone away from it at the end of the day, things have gotten better. This leaves me time to think about the ramifications of having so much material available instantly. I've said before that I love when a site links into the Internet Archive along a theme or a meaning that provides you, the viewer, the patron, with a lot of work done and allowing you to focus on exactly what it might all mean. It's been fascinating to watch when a person is left alone with very few limits on what they can upload and how different people approach that task. Some treat each item as a unique and special self-contained world with its own descriptions, all of the metadata, and an indication of where other parts can be found. Other folks are just happy to throw it over the wall, just upload it, not describe it, walk away, feeling like even though there's not any way for people to discover it, the material will be saved possibly indefinitely, for their action. Naturally, all you need is a small amount of people being chaotic with their uploads for everything to look like an honest mess. That's the danger of what we're doing. But the wonder of it is how much material in there with just a small amount of care and a Tom-like tour guide could be life-changing for the people who are told about it. Left alone, the Internet Archive is itself a barn full of honky-tonk jukeboxes and organs waiting for someone to play them, to hear them live again, to experience them on their own terms. And my hope, as time goes on, is to turn more and more to that role that Tom played, to go between items, either as myself or as somebody who has inspired others to take the role, and walk from exhibit to exhibit, explaining to you what's there, and each of these tours being wrapped in around each other, hundreds, thousands of tours being taken on any given day, where people are learning what they want to learn, and being presented to them, where people are finding themselves with what I know is a near endless pool of fascination and wonder. Here's to tours, here's to tour guides. And may the automatic music sound as sweet 
as the day the machine was built. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Peter Healy, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Sean Kelly, John Sturm, Manxalot, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. There was one additional part to this tour that was very special for me. Wandering around the gift shop and buying a few things and having one of the board members play a voice of Edison for me on an old machine, we finished up our time at the museum and walked outside, and Tom, the tour guide, was sitting there. And he stood up and nervously said to me, I know this sounds odd, but you look so much like an old friend of mine who used to play steel guitar, and he died in 2012, and I was just wondering if you knew or were related to him in some way? Well, I gave him some facts about my family, and it quickly became obvious that I was never that person. I certainly didn't know steel guitar. And he apologized for wasting my time. And I said, but for one moment during the tour, your friend was alive again for you. How could that not be a wonderful day? <laughs>